I'm Shiloh Holly, the Executive Director at the Morris Jamel Mansion. I want to welcome you to this afternoon's program, which is presented as part of the Harlem Renaissance Centennial Celebration organized by Harlem One Stop. The Morris Jamel Mansion, located at 160th and Edgecombe Avenue, is Manhattan's oldest house. Originally constructed in 1765, this building has seen 255 years of history and has been witness to the evolution of American life from the colonies to the present. A part of our work is to look within and beyond our walls to bring history alive and to make it relevant to today. This year, 2020, we look forward to bringing you expanded programmatic offerings, which speak to a more comprehensive and inclusive history at the site. I'm honored to introduce today's program, a talk which was originally presented live on site this past February, where architect and historian John Reddick explored the influence of colonial design in Harlem's early modern architecture from the 1920s to the 1940s. Today's talk, Architecture as Identity, Harlem's Colonial Inspired Style, is held in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance and is presented by the Morris Jamel Mansion in partnership with Harlem One Stop and the 40-member Harlem Cultural Collaborative, which showcases the artists of today while highlighting the artistic and creative energy and exuberance that became the nexus of African American cultural identity and made Harlem a world renowned community. And without further ado, we turn to John Reddick, who will speak from the grounds of the mansion, sharing more about the structure and the buildings that surround it, all while reflector, reflecting on architecture as a tool for empowerment. Hello, my name is John Reddick, and I want to welcome you to the Morris Jamel Mansion, which is standing behind us. It was the headquarters of George Washington during the Revolutionary War. Uh, my background is in architecture. I've been a resident of Harlem since the 1980s, and this colonial structure is actually one of the oldest houses in Manhattan. What we're going to talk about as we move through this area and look at the house is actually something very different than 1765. We're going to be looking at the Harlem Renaissance and what this house meant in terms of modernism to the African Americans that inhabited the area. Well, here we are on the grounds of the Morris Jamel Mansion. Uh, the estate dates back to the founding of New York and uh, the American uh, Revolutionary War period. Uh, as you see the trees in the uh, setting, you can imagine this is not what most people think Harlem looks like, but yet we are. We're at the northern end of Harlem, which is now known as Washington Heights. Uh, as we move through the, the grounds, you can see behind us uh, Sylvan Terrace, a uh, housing development that was built as the area was subdivided. And you can see the, the outgrowth of trees and the sense of one of the highest elevations uh, in New York City. Uh, as we get to the eastern side, we have broad views of uh, the Bronx and out to Long Island. And to the west, we have views of the Hudson River and New Jersey. So it was a very special place. It was very distant from downtown. So these are really like the country estates, uh, escaping the congestion of downtown and a much more healthy, open environment that you still feel today. The Morrisonville Mansion was built in 1765, and it's one of the oldest houses on Manhattan, uh, still standing from that period. But it's a wood structure, even though from a distance you would think of the building as being stone. When you get up close and feel it, you'll realize the boards abut one another, and uh, in the corner, the, the woodwork is beveled to look like stonework. So from a distance, you would think it was a masonry structure. And you see very similar detailing at Monticello and Mount Vernon and other founding fathers who wanted to mimic English and European style housing, but didn't have the same resources. Uh, so if you go to England, you might see the same style house, but you almost never would see it in a wood uh, construction. And this is one of the most significant details about the house. It's got a projected portico, the first in the United States to ever so do so. And the columns is being projected, it's about eight feet from the front of the building, because a very like temple-like front. 
and we're at, we're at one of the highest elevations in Manhattan. And so as people came up from the south, this is the view that they would have seen coming up from lower Manhattan. So it's sitting on this outcropping, almost like the temple on the Acropolis, a very broad view. As we look at this column uh, front of the Morris Jamal Mansion, many of you might think it looks like Terra from Gone with the Wind. And even though that style was, was very much copied from this house, this projective portico was the first in America. And it gets replicated in the facade of the White House. And also, if you go to the Metropolitan Museum, the United States Bank building facade, which is in the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum. This style becomes a classical order. And so you realize for African Americans how significant being in proximity of something that represents what was an oppressive architecture to be something that was part and parcel of the fabric of the neighborhood. Looking across from the Marsh Javel Mansion in 1914, developers picked the site at 555 Edgecombe Avenue, what was known at the time as the Roger Morris Apartments, named for Roger Morris, who was the inhabitant of the Marsh Jamel Mansion. In 1914, however, when it was built, it was for an all-white tenancy. Uh, but by the 1920s, at the height of the Harlem Renaissance, it started to be occupied by prominent African Americans. Uh, one of its tenants was Joe Bledsoe, who was the star of Showboat, later to be followed by Paul Robeson, uh, Count Basie, and a lot of other prominent uh, musicians, most of whom chose to live in these apartment buildings rather than brownstones. And for African Americans who were going to move into this apartment building, it gave two things, uh, aspects of what modernism was about. The sense of elevated perch, which the apartment building provides with its 14 floors. And then a proximity, which all of New York does for Harlem in a certain way, where African Americans are living and looking out their window to iconic structures that are showing up in movies and magazines. It makes where they are seem uniquely special. Just south of here was 409 Edgecombe, uh, which also attracted a lot of the political players. Walter White who was head of the NAACP, uh, Aaron Douglas, who was a famed artist of the Harlem Renaissance, a lot of art for publications and murals that were in the Schomburg and other uh, collections. And uh, Thurgood Marshall, who would be a lawyer for the civil rights uh, movement, would live in that in 409 as well. So it was a rolling uh, building of status and position where they feel real pride to invite someone like Gershwin or someone who might live on a tower on Central Park. They would offer them almost a similar environment in these buildings uh, up in Harlem. Some of the greatest images that sort of reflect back on the Harlem Renaissance and the journey of African Americans to New York is a series of murals that were done for Harlem Hospital. In particular, there's one that's known as the sort of transition uh, image in those murals from the south to the north. And in that image, you can really see uh, African Americans who are in work clothes and in an environment that's very much uh, the rural south to coming to the big city and the images of industry, air flight, uh, bridges like the George Washington Bridge. So it sort of showed modernism and this new life that New York City had to offer. We're to the northern uh, part of the property of the Marsh Jamel Mansion. And this is the garden, so sunken garden to the north. And that was done during the WPA. It was a WPA project in the 1930s. It has a lot of uh, colonialized detail, but also very modernist. There's a garden gazebo-like building and the boxwood plantings, again, referencing the historic period of when the house was built. A couple of things as we talk about uh, the sense of modernism, you have to think of where African Americans were perceived uh, in the period before the Harlem Renaissance. So being able to come and be associated with a historic property that was part of developing the neighborhood for which the neighborhood had tagged names like uh, Washington Heights, and also the bit really human sense of being in a very elevated part of the city. It was where rich people had lived during the colonial period. It was an area of relatively new development early in the 20th century. So for African Americans who were coming from the Caribbean, Caribbean and other places is giving them an elevated sense of presence and participation in American life. Mm -hmm. 
What's really great about 409 Edgecombe and uh, the Roger Morris 555 Edgecombe, which is behind us, is that during the Harlem Renaissance period, with Prohibition, people from all over the globe are coming to Harlem. And one of the key players was Carl Van Vechten. And if you were to look at Carl Van Vechten's collection, the array of performers from Gladys Bentley, uh, the drag, uh, female performer, to Paul Robeson, to Joe Bledsoe, uh, to Josephine Baker, are documented in his photographs, but not only is he entertaining them at his home downtown, but he's coming up to these addresses with his friends uh, to be entertained and take in uh, the environment that is Harlem. And so that mix of both the entertainment side, the hanging out, the having drinks, the being bad, the being good, and connecting with what was really modern is the black experience, the rhythms, the writings, this sense of bridged life, both socially and intellectually, is a key component of what this neighborhood brought uh, and these buildings facilitated during that period. Probably one of the most famous players of the Harlem Renaissance was Madame C.J. Walker, uh, whose daughter, Alelia Walker, really became the emblem, symbol of the entertainer, uh, the gadfly of the Harlem Renaissance. Actually, uh, Langston Hughes says that when Aaliyah Walker died, that was really the end of the Harlem Renaissance. And she would take over her mother's house, which was in central Harlem, which is very much in the classical style. But when she started using it really for parties, she had moved to one of the towers, to the, uh, the apartment towers to the north. She called that party part of the house the dark tower and had an a architectural bookcase that was designed by uh, Paul Franco that was called the tower skyscraper bookcase. So you see that the word tower and the sense of modernism and what a tower offered was part of the elegance and the glamour of the Harlem Renaissance. As we were talking, the Roger Morris being next to the Morris Jamel Mansion, or 409 Edgecombe with his panoramic views to the Bronx, uh, as we follow the Harlem Renaissance period into the 1940s, other areas of Harlem are opening up, and places with great sightings like Riverside Drive and looking off to the Hudson River, we get uh, writers like Ralph Ellison or singer Marian Anderson as residents, or near City College, apartment buildings on Common Avenue would attract Philippa Schuyler, a famed uh, African-American pianist, and other prominent players uh, like uh, Billy Strayhorn to the neighborhood because they had these great views and associations with the City College campus. Another great expression of modernity, uh, if you were to think back of the lack of mobility that African Americans had, the automobile was this free expression of movement. So you'll see in raccoon coats and roadsters and fantasy photographs or uh, noble Sissel in his roadster in front of his house, the sense is this freedom of movement that the automobile gives. The George Washington Bridge, which we would see if we were on the roof of the Morris Jamel Mansion, rises above the cliffs of the uh, Hudson River to allow New Yorkers to go back and forth from New, to not only to New Jersey, but the broader expanse of America. That bridge was really one of the first expressions of true modernism and a, and a structure that Le Corbusier, when he came to America, thought was the greatest structure he saw in all of New York. It was a pure expression of form follows function. The steel-clad towers, uh, the cabling of the bridge are all exposed. So for him, from a distance, the roadbed of the George Washington Bridge was as fine a line as the cabling and a true expression of what he saw as modernism. As an African-American look at Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance, I think a lot of people think of jazz, uh, the speakeasies, all that activity as being modern. And for whites, it was modern. They were engaging in a culture that they hadn't looked at before and bringing those beats and rhythms to modern life.
But for African Americans, they had not yet experienced the traditional aspects that were glorified in American life. And Harlem and these associations in terms of historic properties gave them that sense of being part of the, the vibe of the past as they stepped off into the future. Two very unique buildings that we'll be looking at in central Harlem that speak to this are the Dunbar and the Harlem River houses. The Dunbar apartments uh, that were built in 1928 and the Harlem River houses that were built under the WPA. Both of them are European style apartment blocks with central courtyards and very different from the tenement style housing that was built in New York in the earlier uh, period. The Dunbar, for example, uh, was built with funding from the Rockefeller family. It has a very so uh, it's a walk-up apartment block uh, with commercial rimming the avenue sides of the building, and really unique uh, apartment blocks that sort of have uh, classical styles around the entry detailing. And the, the Dunbar is actually named for the poet uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who wrote. Uh, poetry and theatrical productions at the turn of the century. And he's actually engraved in iconography over the entrances of the building that pick up a lot of very classical details that you would have seen in colonial architecture or Greek architecture. Uh, there's Greek figures standing next to his profile. Uh, there's the eagle and the, uh, the buffalo uh, head that's representing the buffalo soldier and the African-American. And that iconography is now putting the black face and history onto a building. The other building, uh, the Harlem River Houses, built during the WPA, again, is a very modernist block, but now African-American figures are carved at the entryway, and they're not heroic figures, but the average uh, black mother and father, so more of the working class, but portrayed in heroic proportions at the entry. Well, all this talk about modernism, but you think about modernism, and modernism globally is American life in the 20th century. The 20th century was New York, uh, was its rising skyscrapers, but it was also the beat of the 20th century, the beat of modernism, was jazz and the engagement of African Americans uh, with the global technology of the day, records, film, broadcasts, allowed the Harlem story to be a global story. But the empowerment for African Americans to feel that they were part of it was also the sighting and the sense of their presence in an elevated sense. Not only in the elevated sense of the island, but in how they lived and how they participated in reference to the history of New York City. So when we stand in front of this building and we talk about it being the first portico uh, in 1765, a lot of you are thinking it looks a lot like Tara. And it looks like Tara, and you make that connection thanks to movies and how the African-American story is being told through these other media. So as we look at the rising towers of whether it's uh, the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building, the sense of the Jazz Age, African-Americans gave beat to that imagery and that sense of modernism, but they were getting their strength and their sense of being part of the fabric of New York and American life by their proximity to great sites like Morris Jamel and apartment buildings like 409 and uh, Roger Morris. There's aspects of American life and African-American life that are much deeper than the gloss of what media has offered us, and there's a sense of the evolving history. Everything doesn't happen overnight, it's an evolution. And the evolution of American life and this African-American engagement goes back and forth to status, to history, and the new. And all of this is happening in and around this great house and in its neighborhood, and the sense of really deep, deep human feeling and emotion, the sense of height, uh, and this plateau was just as important to the Native American when this was his habitat as it was to Washington to spot the British uh, on the Hudson River. The African Americans wanted to feel that like they had a prominent place in New York and American life. And so you can never look at where people live and how they interact in a time period and not realize that's part of giving them empowerment, a sense of being a participant in American life, and a pedestal from which to launch the next generation's vision of a better and a much broader American picture.
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Wayne Benjamin. I am the Vice President of the Board of Trustees of the Morris Jamel Mansion, and I would like to welcome everyone once again to this discussion of Architecture as Identity, one of a series of programs celebrating the centennial of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, there were unfortunately some technical issues with the sync in the video, but of the video and the program uh, will be available on both YouTube and Facebook, and I'm sure that the Morris Janel Mansion and Harlem One Stop can also make a direct link to the presentation available on their website. So subsequent to this program, you know, please check those sites uh, for that. Uh, for this discussion, I would like to invite um, two colleagues to join me, uh, Roberta Washington, uh, who is the founder of Roberta Washington Architects, and uh, she is, I think, the founder of one of the first architectural firms led by an African-American woman in the United States of America, and also John Reddick, who is responsible for the Architecture as Identity um, video that we just um, had the pleasure of seeing. And, you know, John, I, I thought that was a, an absolutely wonderful uh, presentation. And I see that we are also joined by uh, Sean uh, Rickenbacker. Um, Sean, if you can turn on your um, video and, and your audio, you can join us in the conversation. Um, I'm happy to say that I've known Roberta and John since the late 1980s, if I'm not mistaken and had the pleasure of meeting Sean for the first time a couple years ago when he attended uh, one of the um, Community Board 12 Land Use Committee meetings and I chair uh, land use for CB12 and have done that for more years than I care to remember. Um, I think that the idea, the concept of architecture as identity is, is quite interesting. And particularly in the, in the context of, you know, celebrating the Harlem Renaissance. I recall having a conversation with a colleague last year when we were thinking about how organizations might put together programming to celebrate the Harlem Renaissance. And the question came to me um, quite innocently, well, you know, why was the Harlem Renaissance important? Could I tell them more? And I think this idea of identity is critical because when you think about it, the Harlem Renaissance is taking place only a few decades after the end of the Civil War, after Reconstruction, and the idea of, you know, what is the identity of, you know, Black people, of African Americans, who gets to, you know, define that identity was really something that is central to the Harlem Renaissance. Black people were saying, we get to define who we are, what our capabilities are, how we should be perceived, and I think the idea of looking at architecture's identity and how that relates to, you know, to the Harlem Renaissance and to the experience of Black people at the time is something that's just, you know, you know, ripe for discussion. So, John, I wonder if you could, you know, share with us, you know, what inspired you to, to um, you know, come up with the theme of architecture and identity and, you know, what are some of the key things that you took away from developing it? Well, I think we should always think about our own personal lives. And I came to New York in the 60s for the World's Fair. And New York was just a special place. And to see this cosmopolitan place and come to Harlem and see predominantly African-American people dominating it, here's a brand that has me associated with it when you're in the physical environment. And you could be up on one, I stayed on 135th Street, and I could see uh, the Empire State Building, you know, looking down the avenue or you could be living on Fifth Avenue, these famous streets. So I think it meant a lot to African-Americans when we didn't feel part of mainstream American culture to be in this environment where you had all the hallmarks of success. So say a building like 409 was built around the period of the First World War. So here's this towering structure in your neighborhood and eventually it evolves that you can live in it. So the sense of reward that you're not gonna have if you were from Mississippi or Kentucky or something, no matter how well you were doing in those parts of the country, New York offered something different. Yeah, and, and indeed, my youngest brother lives in 409. <laughs> and uh, some of the older tenants, you know, shared with him and shared with me all that rich sense of history about the building. Um, Roberta, what do you, what, what are some of the key things you took away from viewing, um, you know, architecture as identity? Um, I think that, 
it was a fantastic uh, introduction to um, a particular type of architecture happening during the Renaissance. Um, and, and I thought though, in terms of, of people who get to admire those buildings, um, I'm not sure that it was the, the black folks who were coming to, uh, who were moving to Harlem um, uh, in, the, in the 20s or, or before, like in 19, starting in 1905. I'm, I'm thinking that they were probably much more concerned with how um, they could afford to stay in anything in a brownstone uh, where they uh, divided the rooms so that they divided the, the space so that they could have a little space that they could afford um, to um, people who lived in um, apartments. Uh, but I think that it's all, I don't want to say it's about class, but I think to a degree, the people who were able to appreciate um, the, the 409s and the, and the magnificent buildings that were available for Black folks coming um, from moving from the Midtown area to here. I just think that it wasn't everyone who could appreciate it equally. And, and I'm not sure that everyone was paying attention in the same way. Well, I agree in terms of there was a sort of definitely strata. I mean, part of why it's called Sugar Hill is that that stretched to this advantage point that was, you know, and all those things are very human. That's what I want to point out, that being at the highest elevation meant as much to the Indians as it did to George Washington or us. It's, it's a, a human quality to be in that uh, position. And those buildings overlooked what was a, a hub of ac uh, athletic activity. The polo grounds were yeah. there. When I look at the, the Renaissance Casino, it was the ballroom where uh, James Reese Europe uh, played music that supported Irene and Vernon Castle. So even if you didn't get in some of those places, you just knew these were the hubs of things going on and to be part and parcel of that, I think meant a lot to people. And to think to have a Fifth Avenue address, you live Mississippi and you come up to New York and even if you were to live in ten to a room, you were writing your cousin back from Fifth Avenue addresses, Madison Avenue addresses, you know, they thought you were doing great even if they didn't know you were living ten to a room. It was a sense that New York could, you know, give you that. No, I think that I, I just want to say I, I think that in terms of what people were feeling, that this was um, a big step above where they were, and that they could appreciate it, and they maybe took it for granted uh, because uh, they lived in, in 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 a certain kind of condition for so long that um, they, a lot of things were appreciated, and a lot of things even besides the mansion. That's all I'm saying. You know, mm -hmm. like Driver's Row was a big deal, right? To see those houses. And, and most of the people who were moving to Harlem at the time could not afford to live there, but they could appreciate finer buildings and they, the and they knew how to appreciate things that, that um, other folks had who lived here before uh, had appreciated. And so they understood that they were lucky in that way. And yeah. I'm just saying that there were there, there were, weren't enough of them able to um, experience um, the kind of living you were talking about. Like the, but you see them all immigrant groups, you know? Yes. So to be able to look out your window and see the Empire State Building and then yes. see it in the movies, you felt you owned it even if you never got inside yes. the building. Yes, no, I agree yeah. that people did take those things for granted, that they yeah. did appreciate. And there were new buildings, and I think that's what we don't think about. I mean, Mrs. Walker, I just was looking up again at the, uh, the Walker's house wasn't built in 1927. So it's almost the end. We're coming into the, the stock market crash and all that. So even though we think of Aaliyah Walker and all those parties, that house in the party period didn't even exist in 1927. So you realize the earlier stuff is happening more in these apartment buildings and some of these other mm -hmm. locations. And even Strivers Road is built in a very classical order. So I'm, you know, yes, I no, and I think that that's uh, one of the things that people appreciate. Uh, Hamilton Grange, mm -hmm. which is not as old as the as the earliest colonial building uh, that you showed, but it still um, was appreciated uh, and somehow it did survive, right? Um, and so I think that, that uh, new residents uh, to Harlem were able to appreciate it from afar and they recognized that these were elements though of some people who had, um, these were things that were used by people who had access to more capital, more money than mm -hmm. most of them did. but. They also uh, put um, certain uh, professionals um, on a pedestal too, because they recognized that these were the important people in their uh, in the community, and that they and that they had, but that these were the ones who had 
most access to those. Right. So Roberta, you're, you're touching upon sort of the, the complexity of you know I identity, I think both then and now. You know, there is an identity that is tied to you know aspiration and moving forward. Um, but you're also talking about to certain aspects, you know, the social justice that you know either you know is or is not present throughout the society. And Sean, as the as the you know director of the Bond Center at you know City College and Max Bond, for which its name was very focused on architecture as being in service of, you know, people and society. Mm -hmm. So looking at, you know, this program, Architecture as Identity, you know, what strikes you um, about, you know, the, both the points that John has made, but also the points that Roberta is making of, you know, who got to enjoy those um, symbols? Yeah, no, no, well, thank you all. And it's lovely to be here with, with John and, and Roberta and miss you guys. Haven't seen you in a while and, and you as well, Wayne. So. So thank you, uh, and thank you, Ewan. Um, but in regards to your question, I, I mean, this is, this is an interesting program and a wonderful program to be having right at this moment because um, the issue of social justice is also an environmental issue. Uh, and so when we're, when we're talking about the buildings that we occupy and, and quite frankly, the buildings we've inherited and, and our lives have become part of, uh, certainly there is this uh, reappropriation um, and a newfound ability, perhaps, as Roberta is referring to, uh, to appreciate uh, certain styles of architecture that contribute to your immediate environment. And so I, I completely uh, understand and, and appreciate John's perspective on what it does in terms of uplifting, uh, let's see, let's say one's uh, perception of the community and what that community is made up of as a kind of physical environment. Right? So the contributions that the individuals make uh, in their striving forward, I think that in part the name Strivers Row uh, is, associate, is a direct association of the people who exist in that environment. Uh, and it's reflected by the kind of stately architecture that uh, is kind of ordered and a sign of success that, that we become accustomed to. But it, but it is a, it is a, um, a complex issue. Right, because we also know that, you know, the colonial period, um, you know, uh, with civil rights and moving forward, even while the Harlem Renaissance was, was, uh, was sort of burgeoning and taking place, uh, it was a constant struggle to, to make those gains. And so I think the, the reality of the architecture was just embedded in that struggle, that certainly these represent some ideals, uh, but perhaps those ideals are different for the different occupants, right? So as we reappropriate, I think the ideals associated with the, with the architecture we might strive for, the buildings we want to be associated with also transforms. A lot of it has to do with what activities take place in those buildings, or as, as John eloquently stated, you know, all of the famous people who occupy some of these buildings uh, become the building in and of itself in terms of the characterization of that kind of style of building and who gets to live there and what might become a kind of goal for those in the future uh, as a kind I mean, of You think about the, the classical orders and like the uh, Greek revival or whatever, when the country was getting started, these reflected ideals of democracy, mm -hmm. deeper, mm -hmm. deeper meaning. And so, you know, you can look at that front of that building and think, oh, terror and oppression or, you know, and, 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 but you also can think about what were the ideals behind it and how can America step up to those ideals and reinvest these structures with the things that were part and parcel of what they tried to represent in the beginning? And I think anytime in American history of African Americans are involved, it's very complicated. And I think you have to be willing to talk about all of it and mm -hmm. not, you know, just say, well, I don't, I feel uncomfortable about this, so it's out the window. So like Burt Williams in this period is rising up as a star and he does blackface. And now because blackface is considered something very negative, his genius doesn't get discussed at all, you know, and they might do that to rappers 100 years from now by just picking out what they think is negative in the music as opposed to looking at the broader innovation they brought to the music. So I think we have to tackle all of it. We can't not like it and push it aside. We have to talk about it in balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the complexity and the context is always an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And also you mentioned um, something about the um, about the sculpture and the fact that uh, buildings, a couple of the buildings now have um, 
sculpts or have the sculptures which reflect something positive or the first probably the first ones that that actually do reflect something positive to be built um, for black folks in in the community and i think that we owe like a great debt to the wpa uh, because both for the um, the buildings the sculpture the um the murals that you were talking about in Harlem Hospital, right? Because of that program, those were done. And one of the things that I think we also should just look at is uh, what opportunities did, I mean, this is along the lines of social justice again, but what opportunities did black architects have to participate? And how did they participate? And John Lewis Wilson, as you mentioned, was one of the architects for the, the, the um, Harlem River houses. And that was like one of two of the first public housing projects period in this country, in New York City, right? Um, and, and to understand that um, just doing some reading about him and, and, that, and work on that project, um, it seems that it started with a protest, right? Um, that there had been a demonstration that were called riots uh, like a couple of years before, like in the 19, uh, 20, 1934, 33 or 34. Um, and at the end of those demonstrations, um, not a lot came out of them. The, the city started talking to black communities and black groups, but um, John Lewis Wilson was named one of the seven architects to work on that project. And this was like the first time that a black architect had been, had worked on a city public project of that type. And Tandy, another black architect, did all of his work for mostly for um, the, the famous buildings um, were for Madam Walker. And so because she had money and she hired him, so the building that you showed um, was one of his buildings. Um, and so she just played it forward. Um, but I think that he also became an important person because of the work that he did and that the community Michael understood Green. how to appreciate um, Black architects too. So I think I see it in terms of what people, um, what was done, who did it, and what people were able to do and how were people able to move up and to enjoy um, some of the best uh, views in Harlem and, um, and also how to how to contribute, but how to also enjoy it. So, that's nice. I, also, if, if we think of the point of view that was established by the WPA, the Work Progress Administration, the bottom fell out of American culture. And so part of the reason they're putting the mailman in the post office and not the governor in the paintings or the people is a whole political change of view. Mm -hmm. And looked at the, the, the broader audience, which we're kind of going through now, looking at the people who are supporting the country under COVID. It was the same kind of thing. It wasn't the governor that saved the country, it's the people all coming together and going mm -hmm. forward. And there was an identity with that, that looked at housing, that looked at work, looked at hiring architects and all that in a broad way that really came out of a, a political point of view. Yeah. Right. It's interesting to note with the Harlem Hospital murals that we now celebrate and that have been, a, that were an integral part of the uh, the new uh, pavilion at Harlem Hospital, which is called the Mural Pavilion, that when they were proposed, the administration of the hospital um, was not in favor of them because there were basically too many black people yes. in the murals and Harlem Hospital at that time did not see itself as being, you know, a hospital, you know, just for primarily for black people. But I want to step back a bit um, to the discussion you were having on the Harlem River Houses and Dunbar. Uh, and contrast that to the earlier discussion of, you know, sort of the, the grander buildings, the classical or neoclassical inspired 555 and 409, because Dunbar and Harlem River Houses, unlike the, the, the grander buildings, which, you know, you know, Black people may have, you know, appropriated and made their own, the way we often have to take things that are not intended for us and say, well, we don't care, we're going to make them our own. Dunbar was, in fact, designed and built, you know, with the intention of providing, you know, decent housing, you know, for black people. And, you know, Harlem River Houses similarly, and I had the opportunity to, to speak with John Lewis Wilson on many occasions. And he talked about the, you know, the amount of care and attention that went into, you know, every square foot of design, because that to be so efficient with the, the limited square footage that was available. And I wonder, you know, how the three of you, you know, look at or think about things that are, 
you know, designed with, I guess, with the mindset, with the, the consciousness of saying, we need to do something, whether it's for, for black people or for immigrants, whomever, as opposed to buildings that are appropriated and taken over, um, you know, later. I just make one point, I'll just go over. But if you think about um, 409 and 555, they take the classical order and what makes it modern is the technology that allows them to build that whole, elevated building. Yeah, right. And so the steel structure, all the things that allow it to be for a developer to find that model and just exaggerate it. But by the time you see the Fountainhead movie, Frank Lloyd Wright and all those people are making fun of the fact that they're exaggerating this classical order inappropriately. And there's some new architecture that really more reflects the structure. And so those other buildings that we're talking about, Harlem River Houses and the Dunbar, really are the first modernist mm. housing that's coming in. And they're looking at low rise development and other kinds of things that are much more in the modernist the classical order and not in the old classical order. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so I'd just be curious, economically looking at that, I mean, right now, Trump wants, administration wants to make the classical order the new federal style of order. <laughs> so you can see that he's taking, you know, the what he sees as control and making that the emblem of like sort of America. And I sort of feel like there's other things that we could be doing. Like the, the, if, he, if his rule was in place, then the African American Museum in Washington would look nothing like it does today and would have to try to conform to look more like mm -hmm. Morris Jamel, which for us would be an oppressive style of architecture right. Right. You know, 200 yeah. years later. Well, you know, what you, Wayne, if I, if I may take that on, I mean, I think the, the issue with, re, with respect to the cultural contributions of Black people, right, that whether it be the arts, uh, literature, um, music, of course. And so when we come to the built environment, you know, the, the discussion changes radically because we, we all understand the, the uh, enormous uh, resources that are required to produce uh, a work of architecture for any community. Uh, so I think, I think the, the um, you know, the, the uh, Dunbar uh, apartment, as an example here, uh, is an extraordinary kind of reality early in its time of us trying to ch uh, deal with the challenge of representation and the cultural contribution we want to make in the craft of building our cities and, and our communities. And it reminds me uh, of a, you know, and I think we all, we, we know him, the, the amazing work of Jack Travis, who raised the question, uh, is there a black aesthetic, all right? Um, and to fast forward to where we are now, even uh, again in, the, in the, the efforts towards more social justice, you know, the question is still coming up. Um, and in this regard, there's been discussions around a kind of Afrofuturism, right? And what does that look like? And many of the artists and architects are experimenting with, with uh, ways of representation that they think begin to reflect uh, the community and the culture in a way that might be transferable to the built environment. Right? And so it's a really interesting discussion. The history is, is lengthy, but we do have these models. I think the Dunbar houses is a really interesting one. You bring up the point of, of the, the reality of how efficient the design overall had to be, right? Uh, and so the, the requirements extend well beyond just the kind of style uh, or the type of architecture that we'll, we'll, we may end up with in these endeavors. But certainly I know that, uh, and I think Roberta would agree, I mean, I worked on the, the Renaissance ballroom development at one point. Uh, and this was, a, you know, the, the challenge again of representing history, representing the contributions of the individuals uh, responsible for, uh, um, the, you know, those contributions in and around the community and also within that particular structure is really a sort of a fraught question. And I think it really involves this kind of engagement of the community and reflecting on what it is that we like to see or what it is we would like to see as a representation of ourselves. So, you know, I'm, I'm again reminded of Jack's uh, work on 116th Street um, where he worked with the architects. He also worked with, as you might know, uh, Harlem Hospital on the mural. Right. right. And so that, that, those are extraordinary opportunities to, again, let the, ourselves, the, the design professionals, as well as the community, 
engage in this conversation about what is it that we imagine ourselves uh, to be in, the term, in terms of the built environment? What are we looking to reflect uh, architecturally as a statement of who we are, our history, our contribution? So, you know, it's, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, we're still here as we seek to gain more uh, territory and, and, and roots I, I, in I our communities. I just look at New York as a really sort of um, a layered fabric. And, I, and so I like the Dunbar in that it brought in commercial on the avenues and, and allowed to pick up some of the rhythms and stuff of the rest of the, uh, of the city and how the city engages commercially with the street and made entrances you know, to the side streets and stuff in terms of the scale and the breakup of the, of the block. Same thing with Harlem River houses. If you go over there now, they just renovated a library at like 151st and 7th Avenue. And it's totally in sync. It's totally modern and accessible in terms of what it needs to be for the library. But it really took its rhythms and stuff from the commercial lines and how commercial was configured in that uh, building. So you could walk by there now and think the library was part of the original you know, design. So I feel like you can do both. You can weave uh, the past, you can weave other aesthetics, but I do think New York has a kind of rhythm at the street and side streets and all that that could be thought about more and engaged. It, it shouldn't be absent uh, some of those other details. Right, and I, I think the the idea of, of architecture's identity, we can also look at, and I think Harlem River Houses is a perfect example of architecture as expressing, you know, attitudes of what is it you're trying to do vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, social justice. I mean, or modernity. I mean, if you think about it, when it was built, having a health clinic built into part of the, the complex was atypical. We, I mean, now we think of it as being perfectly reasonable, but that might have been one of the first signs, and Harlem River Houses is, in fact, the first, you know, new construction public housing in New York City. So think about that. You, you've got a health clinic built in on site. You have other what we would consider to say, you know, community facility rooms or community rooms, but also compare Harlem River houses to the tenements that were around it. And if you read some of the articles when it was being built, the private property owners were absolutely against the construction of, you know, Harlem River houses because, you know, they thought it would adversely impact them, not in terms of bringing property values down, but if you look at Harlem River houses, you don't have any windows that look out onto you know, an eight foot, you know, alley and a brick wall. You've got light and air coming into all of those apartments, even though it might be small and tight. You've got light and air coming into every room and you have these central landscape water. Your battery's getting low. Right, so I mean, you've got a building that in many senses in, is modern and in its design, it is saying something about how people should live. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, what, what you just said in terms of, um, of um, architecture reflecting a black aesthetic um, is something that can only be um, really uh, discovered um, or created when more black architects have uh, the opportunity to build right, mm -hmm. and to design. And I don't think that the situation has changed a lot in terms of architects and work, even in Harlem, where you would expect that you know, black architects would be doing a lot of work. Um, I don't think that the situation has changed much since the time of Tandy, who uh, we only know because he had a rich uh, patron um, who was willing to pay and let him do what he and do whatever he wanted to do. Uh, so I just think that, you know, opportunities uh, could bring out what you were looking for in terms of um, discovering the Black aesthetic in, in architecture. That, um, yes, you mentioned, you know, Jack Travis's uh, uh, work, um, but it's based on having had a chance to be a part of yeah, a team that, that did that and having a team that listened mm -hmm. to what mm -hmm. he was doing. So otherwise... I value that contribution. <laughs> But, and, but I also feel like the Chrysler Building has an African mm -hmm. estate. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this denial, yes. a kind of denial of the Afrocentric influences that have permeated American culture. Yes. So Mojian's painting paintings, he's never been to America. He's listening to Broadway Boogie Woogie and doing a painting. You know? Yeah, I mean, so you could say that, you know, there, there is an aesthetic uh, in that's expressed in architecture. There's not by uh, African-Americans that shares 
uh, some of the, that share some strains with what it would be if, if it were by black architects. So I'm I, mean, just, I, just, I don't say that to say that they've done a better job. I'm just saying that for the culture to recognize that mm -hmm. our aesthetic had something to make, when they like something, they sort of yes. take out the fact that we had well, our culture had anything to do with it. And I think there's a chance. And they don't give us credit. <laughs> they, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and so I, if they value that, they could see an African-American be able to take those, their rhythms, do the same sort of thing. If hip hop's the, the music of the time, how is that being reflected in sort of a, a currency in architecture and other things? And who's the developers of people that are gonna you know, push that forward? And for well, us, most of the time, it's been government initially to give yeah. us access to the bigger projects, not the private marketplace. Right. Well, you know, a couple of other things that, that come to mind in terms of uh, the question of identity. One, the, the process of how we build is, is changed, I think, for the better dramatically. Right? It used to be the master architect, and now we are seeing much more uh, engagement with the communities that are going to be receiving these buildings. Uh, so you, you do have, you know, everyone from architects uh, and the planners in the room, but then you also have those residents, uh, the everyday workers, uh, the youth, who are now beginning to be more involved in, in this process and have a, have a voice. And I think we will start to see more of this aesthetic evolve as those opportunities arise. And, and Roberta is absolutely correct that we certainly need uh, more opportunities for uh, firms of color to be leading that charge because I think we have, uh, we, we know what kinds of questions to ask, number one, um, because this is certainly something that has a kind of history to it now that we can uh, disseminate and get some input that I think is incredibly valuable. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, in terms of the, some of the culture being already uh, uh, borrowed, if you will, the African uh, aesthetic, if you will. You might r realize, particularly in this kind of modern era, that uh, in today's buildings, you see a lot more black brick buildings, right? Mm -hmm. These, and they, they've been described as shadow buildings, the buildings that kind of take a, a background to the context around them. But it's, in, it's incredibly intentional. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the reverse, John, of, of the kind of white clapboard or mm -hmm. the, the kind of white stone buildings that were once present. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to go back to my, my days as a, as a young architecture student. And in the most uh, kind of innocent thought, I thought, well, a black building, why not? Why couldn't it be black? Why couldn't it, the coloration of the building itself? I mean, certainly masonry has come a long way. Uh, but we know that in general, it, it is that hue, that sort of brown, rich, reddish hue. But we see, we're starting to see, and I, I think David Ajay was one of the first architects. I actually uh, recall being in London, and one of his very early projects was, was in a, a, a neighborhood that was undergoing gentrification. And it wasn't, wasn't a new project. It was an existing building that he renovated. And his enti the entire work to the exterior was to simply paint it black. And at the time, if I can get my years right, I think this was late 99, early 2000s. It, it raised a, a storm of speculation as to what was happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was thoroughly modern. And, and David, in his unique way, uh, was not forthcoming as he being the architect. And again, a young architect at the time, not of the fame that he is today. Um, and it was revolutionary. And I think that has now become to be an accepted and almost appreciated and desirable style. Uh, we see it in his contribution in, in Northern Harlem, uh, I forget the name of the project. Uh, just, yes, yes, yes you know, exactly. exactly. Um, and so, you know, we're starting to see, and I think Jack would, would, would agree with, with me here, that an aesthetic is beginning to arrive. There is still lots of discussion about whether or not in general, we associate ourselves with it and appreciate it at any higher level, but it's certainly uh, progress in my opinion. But you know what's interesting with what you just said, Sean, but it also goes back to you know, John's point um, about influences that are not credited. When I look at the Sugar Hill Houses, um, you know, uh, it, it just reminds me of, you know, sort of the 
neo-brutalist architecture. Mm -hmm. So the question then, what were the influences of neo-brutalist architecture? And I, I recall when the, when MoMA, re, not the current iteration, but the, the Cesar Pele version of the mm -hmm. 80s, when that opened, the opening exhibit, I think, was the uh, primitivism. Mm -hmm. And that was looking at, you know, who were the influences of Picasso and all the folks who were their contemporaries? And their influences were, in many cases, you know, um, you know, African and other, you know, that, right. that's what they were yeah. looking at to get their inspiration. Absolutely. If you, if you think about rock and roll, uh, and, and particularly with the British invasion, they all credit and honor yeah. the blues <laughs> musicians yeah. from whom they borrowed or tried to emulate the style. Here we think of rock and roll as white with long hair, whatever, right, but that's right. not the roots of rock and roll at all. So there are so many things that you know we look about look at as as culture that is has as part of its root you know African aesthetic African you know um, influences that is not always credited. So when we all ask all the 20th century African aesthetic, I think we have to go further to say, well, you know, what are we looking at? And are we are we looking carefully enough at what? African aesthetics have already influenced things that we look at every day, but don't recognize. For the full 20th century, because if you look at science, you think of the 20th century just around science, and then you go back and look at Picasso and some of these people that worked before the early part of the 20th century, they were doing highly technical painting. If you look at Picasso's early work, it's really in the old classical school. And now uh, the psychiatrists are coming along and talking about, you know, emotional lives and this other side of the dynamic that's not so defined. And then Picasso goes to a museum and he might be scared by an African mask, amused by an African mask. It's not a pure replication of a human figure, yet somehow it's moving him. So mm -hmm. all the shapers of the 20th century come to New York. Whether you look at music, uh, Showboat, for example, uh, is a show that's written by a Jewish woman, Edna Ferber, and the main character is a black woman who's passing, Julie. But it's not Julie's story she's telling as passing. She's telling the Jewish story of passing, but to an African-American uh, character. Mm -hmm. Same thing for uh, Imitation of Life, the Jewish writer and using passing. So the whole spiritual side of the 20th century, uh, Gertrude Stein is doing Four Saints in Three Acts. She comes to America, she uses the fire from St. Philip's Church. So the whole blackness side, why they want to come to Harlem is the spiritual side of the 20th century. And so you can't look at a piece of art uh, any piece of music, anything of the 20th century, and not state it doesn't have a stamp of African Americans on it. So our challenge is finding the curators, the art historians, the professionals who are going to really talk about that and bring that to light. The evidence is all there. And you know, if you go back to the culture of the architectural players, we were talking to Gershwin, he would talk about James Mishra, you know, but they don't, they're, they're gone. And so the real bridge who influenced them and in what influenced them have been lost to us. I think that's our challenge. We've been there, we've done that. We've, we've lifted a lot more than cotton in American uh, culture, but I think that just doesn't get talked about. So part of my interest in looking at all this is this dialogue of how we interacted, how we took what opportunities we had and, you know, made lem you know, lemonade out of lemons or quilts out of scraps or whatever that, that is. Even hip hop. If you were to go back, I bet you, if you graph the period in the rise of hip hop and the taking out of music in schools, you will see all that sampling came out of the fact that they can't, couldn't play instruments. instruments in absolutely. the way that if you read any uh, biography of jazz musicians like uh, Dizzy Gillespie, I had to pick an instrument in 10th grade. So I picked the flute and then moved to the trumpet. That was part of their education to have the music in schools. We don't have that. But there's a genius in hip hop to me that matches quilt making. That sampling, what legally they can take, finding you know, sounds that they couldn't make in instruments that they could do electronically and all of that. So there's genius in that that we're not even talking about uh, yet. So I don't doubt our genius, I don't doubt, I, none of it. It's just about getting credit for it and, and amortizing the value of it in the marketplace. And so I do feel we're at a juncture where that's possible, but it takes some long-term thinking, not the quick uh, answer. So those things have always interested me. So this talk comes out of that kind of, mm -hmm. that back and forth, it's not as clear as we think it might be. But it's there. It's clear if you're directed. And I think finding voices that can write and connect all that is important. And speaking of challenges, John, you're currently working on a book that focuses on the Black and Jewish music of Harlem. So, yeah, so one of the challenges is, I mean, are you looking at, are there intersections? 
Between oh my God. Every, it's like, uh, well, Harlem was Jewish. It was a large Jewish uh, population in Harlem at the turn of the century, the same, around the same period that Blacks are coming. And I went to a talk and I realized that at the turn of the century, around 1906, huge capital projects are happening in New York. The Williamsburg Bridge and Manhattan bridges are being built. They're tearing out huge sections of the Lower East Side. And when I heard that talk, I was on the Lower East Side. So as an architect, I could come across to see Delancey Street and all these streets that were widened for the approaches to the bridge. And I realized how many Jews had to move. The Marx Brothers, Gershwin, a thousand. And they came to Harlem on the poorer side of it, under the elevated or whatever, because their synagogues were here built by the more well-to-do Jews that were here. So there was an economic mix and all that was happening between different strata of Jewish life. And the same was happening for Blacks being displaced by Penn Station being built. And the people that are well-to-do got housing, but also their followed, particularly around religious life, uh, the poorer constituents came. But Black or white, Jewish or you know, African-American, the music of that period, ragtime music, was the hip hop music of that day. And so it wasn't the Charleston, wasn't the first dance that swept Europe, black African-American dance. It was the cakewalk. Mm -hmm. Now cartoons and everything to show they're cartooning uh, in Europe, Germany, France, they're cartooning politicians with cakewalk images of them doing the cakewalk, not black people, but you know, the politicians doing this dance. So there's these kinds of ways of our international influence that are going out there that have been out there. There's a great show that started at Columbia where uh, Denise Morel was looking at the influence of blacks in painters and finding out who the actual people that were being painted, who they were and all of that. And she goes and makes this fantastic connection to all the modernist artists that are in France. So we're there. And I really feel like it's the scholarship and, you know, pushing on a lot of different fronts of how we get the word out and make those connections. Right. And, and Roberta, um, you've mentioned on a couple of occasions, you know, the, the issue of, you know, black architects getting, you know, the, the opportunity to, to do work. And you are working on, as I recall, a book that is, you know, sort of tracing, you know, the, the history of, you know, Black architects in America dating back to pre-Civil War, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, well, there is a book that dates it back to there. I'm mm -hmm. doing, um, I'm writing about Black architects and the history of Black architects and architecture, by them in New York State, right? Okay. And I thought it started like in 1904 when Bert Near Tandy came to New York. Um, but uh, then I uh, learned that there was uh, someone uh, named E.R. Williams uh, who was here and one of the more famous architects of his period who never, no one since then seemed to know. But this was the person who um, designed the, what was going to be the original um, Black History Museum on the Mall, right, in 1924. In a very classical style. In a very classical style because he wanted it to win. He wanted it to fit in. He didn't want it to be rejected. So, I mean, but I think that uh, Black architects can sometimes be chameleons. We can design in what style we like, think the client, you know. So he just, yeah, so he did do a very classical building, uh, which was funded for some years and lost funding and and politics inter intervening. But that person is someone no one's ever heard of who was the best known black architect, one of the best in the country. And he lived in New York, worked, lived and worked in New York. So yes, yeah, so it's been, it's been fascinating to read and discover about these, these little known folks. Right. We seem to have lost Sean, but we're also at the point of the program where I think um, I want to ask Shiloh at the Morris to Mill Mansion to um, help us uh, with any questions that may have come in. Ah, Sean is back uh, yeah, during sorry. the program so that we can address that for the next you know, 20 minutes or so. So Shiloh, um, what do we have? Yeah, thank you, Wayne. And um, I'm having issues starting my video, but I will go ahead and ask the first question. Uh, there seems to be um, a few questions, especially from uh, Laura and ER about the status of the buildings that you guys referenced earlier, um, specifically uh, those that were mentioned in, uh, as being markers of success among Black people, the Harlem River Houses, Dunbar, 409555. 
who currently lives there and are they currently um, sought after as status symbols? Mm -hmm. Well, 409, I would say 555 and 409 have a pretty middle class uh, tenant, tenant roster and it's evolved over time. I think one, 409 I think is a, um, a co-op uh, co build, co building. And so certainly in the real estate market in New York, it still has spectacular views and all that. I'm sure there's inroads being made in terms of the, the turnover, but it's still a predominantly African-American building, both of those. And also Harlem River Houses. Is yes. Okay. But that Harlem River Houses is one of the um, public housing that's just mm -hmm. gone under developer, not developer, but outside the city sort of management. Right. And but so it remains public housing. Yeah, and, correct. and they're doing some work there. And, it's, and what you can see, there's a lot of interior courts. So if you're on the main avenue that passes Harlem River houses, you see the block. It's a low rise block from the outside in terms of the streetscape. And there's a lot of very private interior courtyard spaces that are very sizable. Same for the Dunbar. The Dunbar runs from 7th Avenue uh, almost to Frederick Douglass. And, they, and yeah, again, it has interior yeah. courtyard space. Right. I think it's important to note that, you know, the, the four primary buildings that we've discussed, you know, 409, 555, Dunbar, and Harlem Rosa Houses, they're all landmarks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you may not have, uh, you know, judges and entertainers living there now, but also you have to realize that, you know, New York City in the 21st century versus New York City in the early 20th century, the housing market was terribly segregated. So like Billie Holiday would say, she can be a queen on the stage of Carnegie Hall, but she can't catch a cab when she leaves there. So, you know, the, you know, the ability to live in a 409 or a 555, um, it's not clear that, you know, Ellington would be able to live in one of those towers downtown. So, you know, we still have, and let's not, you know, try to, you know, make it anyway, we still have discrimination in housing in New York City, but you're not as limited, so folks don't have to only go to a handful of, you know, buildings that are considered to be key prestige buildings. But that is an important right. point. A lot of the prominent players could not live downtown. And mm -hmm. so probably why they gravitated to 409 and 555 is that downtown people could come visit them and do things that they were trying to, somebody like Walter White or somebody's trying to broker some union boss or whatever, he felt he could bring them to his house and show a certain kind of aesthetic life in Harlem that he couldn't get. So he's got a view that's just as spectacular as being on Riverside Drive or um, uh, on Central Park. So he's, he's using those tools to also elevate uh, his position, which he couldn't have done downtown. And these buildings actually predate some of the buildings downtown. So uh, the skyscrapers that we think of on the Upper West Side are come after uh, mm -hmm. Um, so our next question is about if there are any uh, contemporary examples of architecture as Black identity in New York. And a follow-up to that is uh, asking about uh, architecture pipelines within uh, HBCUs. Okay, pipeline. Okay, um, in terms of pipelines, I'm not quite sure what you mean. You mean um, schools that teach cool. architecture? Correct. In the schools that teach architecture, um, I think that there um, that a, that a large percentage of the pipeline work in terms of getting students, recruiting students who uh, become interested in architecture and follow that path, um, is um, sort of led by the National Organization of Minority Architects, which um, has offices in um, maybe um, twenty cities across the country. And in those cities usually have programs that are actually called pipeline programs that recruit and look for students in junior high or even high school and sometimes even younger uh, to get them interested um, in architecture um, at an earlier age than they would normally be if they just went to school and talked to their guidance counselor. Um, and some of those programs are really dynamic and they um, really address um, ways of teaching to students of various ages and of familiar uh, or introducing them um, to the concept of building, to putting things together, of um, being observant, of looking at the environment. Um, and uh, so I think that that's what it is. The, and the, and the um, 
and the black colleges and universities, um, there are very few that have a school of architecture. I think that there are now um, we're down to four. Uh, we have four or five. Um, and um, and, uh, and they do their best, but I think that you know, they also have funding issues. Right. On the other yeah. hand, you know, black architectural students don't necessarily just go to the uh, historic black colleges. So Sean, no. you're at, you know, City College, which has, you know, one of the five schools of architecture, I think, in or maybe six in New York City. Mm -hmm. in the sense of, you know, how, um, what is now the Spitzer School of Architecture, what yes. school when I went there, how they're approaching um, the issues we're discussing? Yeah, no, well, so, uh, Number one, we are the state's, uh, you know, well, there's two now, but we were certainly the oldest uh, public school of architecture uh, in the state. And uh, because we're located here in New York, uh, I believe we are the most diverse uh, student population, that is, uh, in any school of architecture in the country. Uh, and so, and I have to say, uh, as of, um, January 1st this year, we also have uh, the first African-American woman dean uh, as uh, the head in the School of Architecture, um, Leslie Loco, who's joining in a, us by way of the UK and also South Africa. Uh, and, and part of that, that uh, selection, which was after a very long uh, and exhausting uh, search uh, committee that I was actually on, uh, we, we clearly identified uh, a need as well as the timing that uh, the issues of social justice delve directly into the history of environments and how environments condition uh, the individuals who live there. And so uh, we saw a tremendous amount of interest from young people in controlling or having an interest in developing their communities and their environments. And, and that sort of dovetails into how the profession and also the education of an architect is, is perhaps mutating a little bit to not just focus on the creation of buildings, but literally the creation of communities in which buildings are a part. Of. And so, you know, I, th I think uh, Roberta's already answered the question about the HBCUs, but certainly, you know, there's a long tradition uh, of the HBCUs uh, producing what is a pipeline of architects into the profession. Um, and we are perhaps in danger of, of losing some of that thrust. Uh, but now that, that the uh, other institutions, particularly the public ones throughout the country, uh, I think are now starting to see that uh, the profession, the history of the profession, uh, still has to um, imagine itself opening, it, opening itself up uh, to others to be able to contribute to this effort. Well, and, but if you, I go visit friends, I'll be working on a project and I'll be going to architecture offices with 40, 50 more people. And I don't see a minority person anywhere. And yeah. I'll bring it up and it's like, oh, and they'll kind of look around like it's, they're not aware that that's true. And I don't feel like it, you can't do something that's valued if you're not valued in the marketplace. And so uh, are these big firms reaching out and really trying to find uh, African American, you know, minority, minority students for work and work experience and, and all of that. I feel like there's got to be some reward to engage the, the broader skill set that allows mm -hmm. you to go do battle. You can't do battle without experience. Yeah. That, yeah. The, the issue of diversity, particularly when it comes to, you know, Black people in architecture, is a conversation in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So you don't Absolutely. want to have this now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's no different than any other aspect of the culture. I mean, you could go to museum curators. You go, I mean, I feel like we're always bringing up something as if some, it's like it didn't exist until I brought it up. But if you, anybody that's observant could see that it's not, it's not diversity in these offices and places. So it's a real burden to have to keep bringing it up all the time. Like somehow, if I didn't bring it up, no one would notice. No one wants to notice. So I think part of the current climate, I hopefully will make some difference. Yes, no, I, I think that, uh, yes, things that are happening, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement has reached there too. Uh, but I think that sometimes it's also, um, it, it can also, I guess I'm very concerned about the firm, the Black architectural firm. And I think that 
that is the thing that is most in danger of, it, of um, dying and not coming back. Uh, I think now that um, we have changed, some things have changed. And so um, many more black architects are being hired um, by um, what, were, what were before large uh, majority white firms. But then you have to look at what happens in terms of um, how that uh, increases the uh, acceleration um, of mm -hmm. the demise of Absolutely. the government. Because Absolutely. then um, once um, black, firm, black architects who used to have their own firms are now part of the, the larger um, white firms, and those firms don't have to say, they, they're not really, they can, they can represent themselves as um, multi-cultured firms now. And so the projects that might have gone to um, a, a black firm um, now goes to them because they can say that they have all of these black architects working for them. So they sometimes can. it's a double-edged yeah, yeah. sword. And, yeah. and, I, and I guess I just would like to say, uh, um, just in terms of, um, I was just reading today about um, the Urban League's new uh, building on 125th Street, um, which is um, done by a well-known um, uh, firm, mostly white firm. Um, and, I, and I was also thinking about how one of the most important things that happened in terms of architecture period was that Whitney Young spoke, yes. uh, representing the Urban League, uh, spoke at um, the 1968 um, conference of the American Institute of Architects. And in that talk, um, he, did, he did get through to them. I think he was worried about that he got through to them. Uh, he shocked them. He um, scared them, made them think that they were going to be terrible people if they didn't turn around and, 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 and just recognize the error of their ways. Um, and so things did change. Um, and they started giving scholarships and they started making it, uh, consciously making the AIA um, more uh, multicultural. And, um, and so it's just very interesting to see that uh, for the building of um, uh, the first civil rights uh, museum in uh, New York um, City, that um, as far as I know, no black firms were seriously considered. Um, and um, so I think that like people forget and that we probably like need to take this period to remind uh, people of how far we've gone, but how far we still have to go. And, um, and to uh, work with them. So, you know, you, you raise a point, Roberta, about the, the, um, the non-minority firms hiring minority, you know, architects and saying they are diverse. And, you know, to some extent they can and they can't, as you know, in, you know, in my day job, mm -hmm. <laughs> where, you know, we're very focused on um, MWB participation and to, for a firm to claim that it is minority or women owned it literally has to be at least 51% owned and controlled. So to say that you've hired, you know, a lot, I mean, that adds to the diversity of the workforce, but if we're looking at hiring a firm that is owned and controlled, that's different. But that then goes to the people who are hiring architects, mm -hmm. do they have the consciousness to say that I want to focus on hiring a firm that is owned and controlled? And good luck finding them there. <laughs> This is, so this is the problem, I think, is that, um, you know, so if there is a, uh, as a black, uh, and I keep thinking of California, because I know of some, of some projects there, um, where um, people from the community, um, black folks now have the possibility of deciding who the architect is right. themselves, right? right? right. Uh, and they are projects in the community that 15 or 20 years ago, would have gone to a black firm because they would have approached a black firm and said, this is, you know, what we're interested in doing. But now those firms, the black firms don't really exist and are, are not existing in larger numbers and they're, the firms are small. But those big firms can now say, you know, well, we have those people. They work for us now. So this is who you were going, this is who you would have hired <laughs> before anyway. So you know, they're here. You can say that, but it depends. Upon, it really depends. And, you know, my, my time at Harlem CDC um, made me realize that, you know, the client 
plays a really important role. Absolutely. Because the client, the developer, in many cases, they're calling the shot. So if someone, someone can represent them, their firm as being, whether it's the architectural firm or the contractor as being diverse, but if we're thinking about social and economic justice and we're looking at you know, who controls the dollars going to that project, it's the people who own and control the firm. And they also are the ones who are able to make the decision on hiring and firing and all the life of the firm. So you, you, know, it, you can point your firm out as being diverse, and that's important. But if I'm the client and I'm concerned about hiring you know, people, hiring firms, that are in fact, you know, owned and controlled because I'm concerned about the sort of the social and economic justice of, you know, who gets to have and build a business and who only gets to for their entire life just be an employee. Those are some of the things you'd want to think about. And the other interesting point that you mentioned in terms of introducing, you know, students to to the profession is, you know, when does that become something that is even presented as a profession? And in, in, junior high school, middle school, whatever you want to call it, back in the early 1970s, you know, you know, we had to take some, you know, mandatory courses and shop was one of them. And I was introduced to like mechanical drawing back then. And for high school, I went to the high school of art and design. And in the first year, you had to take what's called rotational. So every art major the school offered you took for a several week period. And then for the last two years of high school, you had to major. So in high school, I majored in architecture for two years. And so then going into college, I was was continuation of a profession that I was introduced to in high school. But I was also introduced to photography and package design and illustration and theater design. And the question is, at the high school level, are these professions, are these options being introduced to people so that as they're looking forward to college or even just going directly into the field, that is something they're even interested in and is a possibility. Yeah, same. I went to a vocational high school with that same kind of, you had a rotation in ninth grade and then you had the other, you know, choices to the end. So even knowing I had to take a language, the things I needed to do, even get into college, I was exposed to that, you know, in the high school level. Well, you know, Wayne, this, this reminds me of, you know, Max had done so many things. I'm speaking of Max Bond and, and with the Architects Renewal Committee, uh, you know, they, they had a pipeline program and I think, I think Ken Knuckles is, is actually a graduate of this, yep, this program um, like it too. but but it but it points to the issue of how important it is for the, the creation of, of, of architecture and community involvement because it's also there where that exposure happens and so you know I think of all of the work that that Arch had done the architects from rural committee and you know, through that community participation, they actually launched some projects that then were later funded and supported by the city uh, to go forward. Uh, and so, you know, I think what we're, we're starting to see again, and I think the profession got away from that. I, I mm-hmm. think, you know, professions mm-hmm. worked solely with the preferred client uh, where they didn't have to answer to so, so many uh, constituents. But now, uh, and perhaps it's because of the economy and, and, and now, so many more people have been impacted by gentrification. Um, I think before COVID, unfortunately, there, there, there was a housing crisis. So, so many more people are now fully aware that so much more is at stake. And I think that opens the door for much more participation uh, and engagement and interest uh, from young people as, as we go forward. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to communicating that uh, because I know that um, some of the young people I speak to are raising some really intelligent questions about their environments and what's, what's taking place. And they, and they want to be able to do something. And I think architecture is just one of the disciplines where they can certainly be effective. Right. Thank you, Sean. That's a perfect segue into our next question. Um, is there a Black aesthetic emerging from uh, architecture schools today, uh, HBCUs in particular, and um, a a sub-question from someone else is, uh, what are contemporary examples of architecture as Black identity in New York? Well, uh, you know, I'll I'll take a stab at this. I I would say that the, the, the wonderful part of an architectural education is the exploration, right? You, you can explore one's identity, uh, 
and that's not dependent on being uh, of the majority um, in terms of the kind of cultural representation. But I think, uh, you know, the diversity of City College, I'll speak for, for the, that institution where I'm affiliated, uh, you know, we have students from all over the world. And so the, the question of identity where we started uh, and how you transmit that into uh, a work of architecture or the built environment is always something that's under exploration. And I think it's now just involving multiple voices. It's not just the architect who determines whether or not there's a black aesthetic, there's an Islamic aesthetic. It is a conversation that needs to be had with the users of those buildings, uh, the larger community that will be hosting that building and that that building will become a part of. So I think that, that that's key. And because we are becoming more diverse as a profession, uh, you're hearing more about this conversation about cultural aesthetics. Uh, communities like Harlem who've existed for so long and the, the, the tremendous historical and cultural contributions to our overall culture, uh, you know, one could look for buildings there to see, is this representative of this culture and the contributions it's made to the world? And, and I would say, you know, it's a challenge to find an overt piece of architecture that communicates that, but the question and the challenge still uh, arises for those who are studying architecture. So, so hopefully that answers the, the, the first question. The, the second question about, um, well, I'll let someone else take, up, take the, the second question. I, I think it was uh, yeah, I, I an just interesting one. To, to point out, going back to you know, the issue of what are, you know, Black or African African American, you know, influences. I mean, when Roberta, when you design, you know, 1400 Fifth Avenue, um, mm -hmm. you know, which I, you know, worked on on the, you know, marketing side, you know, it, it's, you know, I think one needs to look deeper into, you know, how the design was thought out to see what's influencing. And for example, the light sconces on the outside, they they are their design is influenced, as I understand it, by African masks. So you did not just take, you know, something that is, and apply it, you know, you, you needed external light fixtures, but the design of that, you know, you know, could be anything you wanted it to be. Yeah. It's and designed it. influenced by those African yeah. and And um, the, um, the, the, fent, the railings were, were based on uh, Kedinka symbols. Um, that had uh, meanings and significance in terms of what we were trying to achieve too. Uh, the floor of the lobby um, uh, was a design um, in stone that was also based on um, African origins. Um, and, but I think, um, and, and I think that the, we were able to do this because we haven't mentioned one thing that you really do have to have to do that. And as a client who lets the architect- You had a black do, developer. <laughs> and so we had a client like that, who was also the client of the uh, Kala, Kala, Kalahari. Yes. Kalahari. The Kalahari. So I, I, and I, and I always uh, admired the Kalahari because that's a, a building where um, the very skin of the building is uh, reflecting um, what could be an African um, aesthetic in terms of the design uh, exactly. that they did in brick, right? Um, and so I think that what I did was what I could do at the time. Um, but yes, I would love to have had uh, an opportunity to do something, uh, to have a client who said, okay, go ahead and do what you and that was, that was um, to allow us to experiment into something that old. But I, and I think even Jack Travis's uh, uh, work at Harlem Hospital is a continuation of that. Um, but Wayne, without opportunities. Wayne, I, I wanted to add also to that, the, that question. Um, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but you know, when Max was, was doing... Um, if I'm not mistaken, the Strivers Gardens uh, was a project by Max Bond, mm -hmm. 135th Street, um, 8th Avenue. And, uh, you know, it came to my attention. We, we invited a, a young man who did a, a I'm trying to remember his name, who wrote a book on the, uh, oh gosh, if, if I'll, I'll put it in the, in the chat if I remember, but 
he revealed that in Max's work, he chose very specific materials mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to ensure economic equity in terms of who would be working on the projects. And so masonry was Max's preferred building material as opposed to curtain walls or, or aluminum panels because he knew that there was a culture of, of uh, mason, masons within the, the, the community and, and also outside of the community. But typically you had an opportunity by which those laborers, those construction workers would be granted an opportunity based on the material and also, I believe, certainly the material had an affinity to the community of what already existed. But I, but I thought it was very interesting that sometimes an aesthetic is born out of another thought process. Well, I think that that particular one is a social justice Absolutely. process. Absolutely. And um, so it just means that uh, sometimes uh, uh, Black architects or, or architects who want to respect um, the, the history and the and the, the presence of, of uh, people of color, um, looks to ways to um, um, show that they recognize uh, mm -hmm. where they are. Um, and I, I think that um, Max's uh, choice of materials uh, was something um, that taught all of us who, who heard talk about it, uh, that there were different ways of looking at um, uh, Black culture and, and neighborhood culture and embedding it into um, projects that are done in the community, right? So it's not just about, you know, are you able to um, show um, uh, an African aesthetic, but um, what can you do to show that you're respecting the people who are there now, who are in front of you and who will be living in these spaces? and the people who are going to work or not work um, and not have an opportunity to work on the building. Right, so who, who gets his, to build it. Yeah. Because his decision um, made it possible for uh, Black folks who were trained that particular time and maybe still now um, more in masonry mm -hmm. than doing the, the glass walls um, to participate. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if he could think of other ways to make you know, if possible for black folks to participate. He, he, well, for me in public art projects, I mean, for the public art projects that I've been involved in, that's been the sort of mandate. I was involved with like Ralph Dollison and Frederick Douglass. And, and so really trying to find really good artists and making sure if it's in a community of color, if that's the audience and they're getting the money and raising the money for the project, that you really reach out to the talented people and make sure there's a pool of talented African-American people in the mix and someone will get it. You know, I really mm -hmm. do believe in the end, if the talent is there and gets a chance at it, you know, great things happen. And so someone like Elizabeth Catlett was her first public project in New York. And she was, you know, probably was probably not her biggest commission monetarily, but she gave it her all because she really felt it was special for her to do this piece mm -hmm. to Ellison, you know, in the community of African-American people. And we are, we are running a, a, a bit later. We've run a bit late, uh, but I, I just also want to point out, circling back to Max, when he was designing the, the Schomburg, not the Schomburg as it has been renovated, but the original, the, the use of particularly aluminum was kept to a minimum. And that was in recognition of the extent to which apartheid South Africa controlled so much of the aluminum market. So, I mean, it's not what a building looks like necessarily when you think about the aesthetic, it's what are you thinking about when you are designing it? And what are you thinking about, you know, when you're, you think about how it's gonna be put together and who's going to build it? So, you know, masonry was part of it, but also why would you build a building in Harlem that has materials that's coming from an apartheid country? Absolutely. Wow, that's a good place to... Yeah, <laughs> so let me... This is Aluminium. The, go ahead, John. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's, no, that's it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to make I, a little joke about aluminum. But yeah, no, no, no. I want to thank everyone. Um, I, I want to thank everyone who uh, signed in to participate in this. Um, Roberta, John, Sean, great seeing you again. Wonderful conversation. Shiloh, thank you so much for the assist. You and behind the scenes and for pulling this all together. Thank you once again. I want to remind everyone, you know, technical glitches aside, the program, you know, um, the recording of it will be available.
on Facebook and YouTube, you know, available on Morris Jamel's website, Harlem Once Up. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, there, there are a series of programs that are part of this celebration of the Harlem Centennial. And for future programs, you want to look at Harlem One Stop, that's all one word, harlemonestop.org or harlemrenaissance.org. Um, look forward to uh, seeing you, so to speak, all, um, you know, virtually. And once again, you know, thank you for joining us and thank all of you for joining me in this wonderful conversation. Thank you, guys.